Well, good morning, church. <clears throat> In addition to being bitterly cold this past week, it was also the beginning of the season of Lent, the time of preparation for Easter. Now, we haven't focused specifically on Lent this year, but it's not for any nefarious reason. And, and I want to encourage you to take some time over the next six weeks to consider the importance of what God has done for us through the cross, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it will make Easter that much richer for you. <clears throat> but I would like to lead off today with a picture that I hope will percolate in your mind as we're looking at our text for today. The picture is of a child intently making mud pies. Her hands are filled with mud, and she is delighted with what she has. What we cannot see, however, is that just outside of the picture is a hand filled with precious jewels which are being offered to the little girl. But she's unwilling to let go of her mud pies, which she has so carefully made, and so she cannot take hold of the offered jewels. Well, since the start of the year, we've been circling around three intersecting, overlapping ideas. The year of the Lord's favor, the coming of the kingdom of God, and the goodness of God. And in particular, we've been focusing on what it means to say that God is a good God. So in our conclusion to this series today, in the passage from the Gospel of Mark, this passage brings together three stories, three encounters with Jesus. And together they help us tie a bow on our exploration of what does it mean to say that God is good? And what that implies for us in our day-to-day -day lives as followers of Jesus. You and I live in a society where we are inundated on a daily basis, sometimes even on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, with competing claims about what is good and what we should be pursuing and what we should champion and what we should want for ourselves and for others. Everyone has an idea about what good looks like. And there are plenty of people who want to sell us something, whether that something is merchandise or experiences or support for a social cause or for a personal agenda or a story. And underneath all of those sales pitches lies an assumption, an assumption about what is good, what you and I think is good, and what we should think is good, and what we should do to obtain it or to somehow bring it about. And that is why I've titled this sermon, Finding the Truly Good. That's why I think this passage from Mark's Gospel is so pertinent for us today. So let's look at the first encounter. Mark 10, 13 to 16 describes this encounter that involved Jesus, his disciples, and the crowds who were coming to Jesus and bringing their children along. Jesus' fame as a healer and a teacher had spread throughout the land, especially in Galilee where the bulk of his ministry had happened. And as a result, throngs of people came to hear him. And often they came with the hope of being cured of whatever illness it was that was afflicting them. And they also brought their children with them. Now, the parents weren't forced to take their children with them. Most people lived near or with relatives, so it would have been a simple matter to leave the children with a grandparent or a cousin or even with a neighbor. And then the grown-ups grown -ups could go off to see the man that people said was a prophet. But these parents wanted something for their children something that could help them survive, something that could bring them good in the future. Concern for one's children is pretty normal. Most parents in most cultures would feel the same way. And in the first century, there were plenty of dangers that threatened children. Sickness was ever-present, limited medical options. Injuries could cripple a child and make him a beggar. Poverty filled the landscape. Malnutrition was common. Hunger was normal. The mortality rate for children was quite high. And then there's always the possibility of the children just being taken away, sold into slavery, or butchered at the hands of foreign armies. For these parents, Jesus represented a chance, a chance that wasn't available anywhere else. If this Jesus was a prophet, if he was a, a holy man, Perhaps he could do something for their children. Perhaps he could pray a prayer or say a blessing or something that would bring God's power, protect them from plague or from injury, from demons, from the Romans. 
For the disciples, however, the children were an interruption. They were in the way. And the parents who were bringing them to Jesus were causing problems and hindering Jesus from his ministry in the minds of the disciples. Because the disciples did not see the children as inherently valuable, they saw them as consumers of resources, obstacles, disruptions. At best, they were unimportant and irrelevant. But Jesus didn't see the children through those faulty lenses. He loved children. He valued them. He thought they could understand the things of God if you presented them to the kids at their level. And most important of all, they were not to be shoved aside or prevented from hearing about the kingdom of God or how to enter it. Because Jesus' message was not just for the grown-ups. It was for the kids. It belonged to them as well. They needed to hear that God was good. They needed to hear that he had brought the kingdom to them. Then they were welcome to come in. Though, just as for the adults, it would cost them everything. So Jesus rebuked the disciples for rebuking the parents. Let the children come to me, he said. The kingdom of God belongs to them as well as to you. And then he turned all of the disciples' assumptions completely on their heads. Because not only were children welcomed and wanted participants in the kingdom, they were valued members of God's kingdom. They were the perfect example of the only way anyone gets into the kingdom. Jesus said, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. The disciples, like most adults then and most adults now, for that matter, had been conditioned to think that entering God's kingdom required that they prove themselves worthy of being allowed to come into God's presence. They imagined being measured by God, weighed in a balance with their good deeds on one side and their sins on the other, and they hoped that the good side was weightier, or at least close enough that if, if God would just put his finger on it just a little bit, you know, maybe that would be enough to get in. We still think that way. That's why you see all the cartoons about Peter at the gate of heaven. This one, a little different, you know. But it's worth seeing anyway. You know, the, the, you see the cartoons. Peter's at the gate. There's this long line of people waiting to be processed, like they're standing in line at the airport to go through TSA. They want to be granted their, their access, wait for all their paperwork to be processed. But Jesus spoke about receiving the kingdom. Not earning it, not proving to be worthy, not gaining it, obtaining it, but receiving it like an undeserved gift. See, unless they've been exceedingly damaged by their parents or others, or they've been taught otherwise, kids don't normally think of presence as something that they have to earn. They don't assume that they must exchange something for the gift that is offered to them. If you give a kid a gift, she assumes she can have it. She'll take it. And that's the way it is with the kingdom of God, Jesus says. The only way to enter it is to throw away every thought of merit, throw away imagining that you somehow deserve this opportunity. It is a gift. It is offered freely. You only need to humble yourself like a child, admit that you need it, and choose to receive it as a gift. Well, the passage continues in Mark 10 with the story of the man who came to Jesus with this question about how he could inherit eternal life. In essence, how is it that he can enter the kingdom of God? And so it makes sense that this encounter would follow the episode where Jesus tells the disciples, if you want to enter the kingdom, you have to humble yourself like a child and receive it as a gift. And the story offers the readers of the gospel a full illustration of the point that Jesus just made. But I actually want to hold off on that part of the story for a moment. We're going to return here after we look at the encounter between Jesus and his disciples that immediately followed the interchange between this would-be follower of Jesus and Jesus himself. And that begins with verse 23, when Jesus says how hard it is for those who are rich to enter into the kingdom of God. 
And once again, we're talking about fundamental misperceptions of the kingdom of God. The disciples misperceived the value of children. They didn't see them as viable members of the group that was following Jesus. They misperceived what it was that allowed someone to enter the kingdom of God because it wasn't about having more righteous deeds than sins on your account. And now they're astonished to learn that being wealthy doesn't give you an advantage. They were shocked. Because like everyone else in Jesus' day, the disciples assumed that rich people would have an edge over the rest of us when it came to getting into the kingdom. That just made sense. Everything was easier for the wealthy. They had advantages that no one else did. Why would it be any different when it comes to spiritual matters? In fact, everyone at that time assumes that wealth was a sign of God's blessing, a sign that the rich had God's approval. Jesus said just the opposite. And to break through their assumptions, he emphasized his point by using some extreme hyperbole. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Camel, giant camel, eye of a needle. Ouch, really? I mean, that sounds like it's impossible. Is Jesus saying it's impossible for the rich to come in? Not exactly. The reason you use hyperbole is to make a point emphatic and memorable. But why would it be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Most of the rich people I've known in my life were Christians who weren't defined by their money. They didn't think of themselves as entitled to different treatment because they had more than others. But I can tell you that having wealth can lead to some very wrong assumptions, such as that the ordinary limitations of life don't apply to me. That's often true with rich folks. The stuff that everyone else does, I don't have to do that. Or, I can obtain anything I want. You just have to find the right amount of money to put into the hands of the right people who are positioned to help you out. Nothing's out of my reach as long as I've I've got money. Everything, including entrance into the kingdom of God, can be purchased, or so they think. Do we think that? Wealth can hinder us from entering God's kingdom precisely because it presents to us a false picture of our situation. If we have money, however much we imagine is necessary to be wealthy, and typically what we think rich means, rich is someone who has more money than me, however much I have. But if we have money, we might easily assume, wrongly, that God must necessarily approve of everything that we've done to get whatever pile of gold we have. Or that God can be persuaded to look the other way, just to kind of ignore this. If we remember, I'll I'll just give a little extra to the church or to charity or something like that. But if the kingdom comes to us as a gift, it can't be purchased. If the kingdom is available to those who become like children, there's no advantage given to the rich. If the kingdom isn't based on my accomplishments or my list of good deeds then Tevye's dream of all the things he could do if he were a wealthy man makes a nice song in a great musical, but it's completely irrelevant when it comes to entering the kingdom of God. And the disciples needed to understand that the ordinary ways of thinking in this world had nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Living under God's rule wasn't the same as living under the laws of commerce or the customs of patronage or social status. The advantages that the wealthy had in every other circumstance in life did not move them to the front of the line when it came to knowing God or following God's ways. The things that gave you status and privilege in this world didn't matter at all in God's kingdom because the first will be last and the last first. That brings us to the crucial encounter in the middle of this passage. Because the man in the story is pictured as very devout and very earnest. He comes running to Jesus, prostrates himself before him. Now that's out of the ordinary, particularly for someone who is rich. And we learn at the end of this uh, little story that he is great wealth. 
But he's eager to ask his question. He seems intently interested in spiritual things. What he wants to know is, how can I inherit eternal life? That question itself points to someone who is very aware of God, very aware of the reality of sin and death, very aware that he's going to uh, meet God in the judgment day. He's very aware that after his death he will answer for his life. He's very aware and he wants to prepare for that judgment. How do I enter into eternal life after I face judgment with God? To be honest, he's a lot more spiritually aware than many people we meet every day. And his life up to this point shows the signs of religious devotion. He claims that he has kept the commandments of the law since he was a boy. Now that little phrase is a reference to the Jewish tradition we now know as bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah means the son of the commandment. Because at the age of 12, a Jewish boy assumed the status of an adult before God. And having been taught the commandments of the law, he now took upon himself the obligation of full obedience to the law and committed himself to faithfully keeping those commandments. And this young man had done all that he knew to do since the age of 12 when he'd become an adult according to uh, the the culture and the traditions of the law. His piety was not hypocritical. It wasn't feigned. It was genuine. He thought he had done everything he could. But there was something in his question that betrayed a more unsettled heart than his outward appearance suggested. He's uncertain about his status before God. He is seeking affirmation from this notable rabbi who appears to have God's approval. Now there's no question in his own mind of his devotion or of his commitment to follow in the traditions of the elders. His desire to be righteous has led him to a life of strict observance of the commandments of the Mosaic Law. But his question reveals two problems. And the first is that his question indicates that he's thinking only in terms of the scale of good deeds and sins. He wants assurance that his righteousness is sufficient, that he is good. He wants a declaration from this rabbi that he is good enough that God is pleased with his obedience. He does not doubt that his life of devotion has been marked by God and seen to be good. He only asks because he doesn't know if he's done enough. Do his good deeds outweigh his sins? Is there something that he's omitted? Is there something he's inadvertently forgotten? What has he left on the heavenly checklist that he must cross off before he dies? Good teacher, what must I do? Well, Jesus took his question seriously. He gave him a straight answer. He pointed to the very heart of the Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments. And when he heard the young man's answer that he had done all of this since he was a boy, something in his voice grabbed Jesus' attention. And Jesus looked at him. And Mark says he loved him. There was something in the young man's sincerity, in his intensity, his genuineness, his courage perhaps, his willingness to humble himself, something that drew out Jesus' compassion. Jesus felt a love for him that wasn't just generic. It wasn't just God loves everybody. It wasn't ordinary. There was something special he felt for this man, a possibility of who this young guy could be, something that Jesus could see, something that excited him. Jesus wanted this guy to be one of the team. He wanted him to be one of the boys. He loved him. He wanted him to be a disciple. And so Jesus offered him a place at the table. He offered him an open door into the very thing that the young man had requested, a way to inherit eternal life. Jesus loved him, saw something that the man couldn't see himself. Because not only could he see what he might become, Jesus saw the chains around this man's heart that were forged out of his wealth. The one thing he lacked was not another deed on the checklist of heaven. The one thing he lacked was freedom from his riches that had enslaved him. And so the cure was simple, not easy, but simple. 
And so Jesus said, go, sell everything you have, give to the poor, and then come and follow me. It's important to know that this command was specific to this individual. Now, there have been many others throughout the centuries to whom Jesus has said the same thing. I I think of Francis of Assisi and others. But it has never been a requirement for everyone who wishes to be a follower of Christ to sell all of their possessions. How do I know that? Well, we see, for instance, in Acts chapter 5, verse 4, when the very first group of believers after the day of Pentecost are all sharing what they own to support one another, one couple named Ananias and Sapphira chose to sell their property and to keep some of the proceeds for themselves. That in itself was not a sin. Peter very bluntly tells Ananias in Acts 5.4, Ananias said, you are free to do whatever you wanted with your property and with anything of the proceeds from the sale. He was under no obligation to give it all away just because others had done so. But Ananias' sin was in pretending that he had given all that he had when in fact he had not. Furthermore, we have Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy, and he writes and he gives very specific instructions to those in the church who are rich. He says, I want you to be generous with your wealth. How could you be rich in the church if everyone was required to give away everything in order to follow Christ? No, the issue was this man's heart. His wealth was a hindrance that kept him from following Jesus. He'd come to Jesus hoping that Jesus would tell him something that he could do very easily. You know, Maybe use his wealth to influence the community for good. But Jesus saw the bondage. Jesus offered him freedom. And the young man could only see the price tag. He didn't see the value of what was being given in its place. He considered it, and he decided he wasn't going to pay that price. Instead, he turned away, saddened and shocked that Jesus would make such an outrageous demand. But the key that he missed was the main point that Jesus was making. Yes, the price tag was heavy, but the reward was greater. Eternal treasure in heaven that couldn't be taken away. And the crucial decision wasn't really about his wealth. The critical decision was about following Jesus. Letting go of his wealth was simply a step on the way to freedom so he could grasp hold of what Jesus was bringing in, the kingdom of God, the eternal life that the young man had come to him seeking. Will you follow me was the real issue, the question the man needed to answer. Would he choose Jesus over his wealth, over his privilege, over his status, over his comfort? Would he choose Jesus? Would he humble himself like a child? to receive the gift of the kingdom? Or would he hold on to his mud pies and turn down the jewels that were being offered? Did he recognize what was truly good? And did he want that? I said earlier that the young man's question revealed two problems. The first one being that he's only thinking in terms of this scale of good deeds and sins, but there's a second and more telling problem. And it was the issue that ultimately cost him everything he had. Because when he came to Jesus, despite his sincerity, despite his earnestness and his piety, there was a deeper and fundamental flaw in his thinking. And it showed up in his greeting. It shows up in his very first words to Jesus. Jesus immediately calls him out on it before he offers him this chance to choose that which is truly good. Because the man greeted Jesus with a measure of respect. He came to him and said, good teacher. It was flattery. He was addressing him in this manner, appealing to what the man assumed Jesus wanted to hear. He, he was trying to gain Jesus' approval by being respectful. Because the man wanted Jesus to answer him. He, he, wasn't sure if he was like other rabbis and didn't, would be dismissed right away because he wasn't one of his disciples. And he wanted an answer. He didn't want to be treated as if he was not worthy of having his request considered. And so he shows Jesus this respect, greeting him as if he's a revered figure, thinking this will score some points with Jesus. But Jesus cuts right through the flattery. 
ignores the attempt to win his approval and goes straight to the heart issue as he always did. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. It's a very powerful, very critical, crucial question. Why indeed? Why do you call me good? Now some have insisted that what this shows us is that Jesus never claimed to be divine. And according to them, he flatly denies that he's anything other than a man. He's just someone who's seeking to know God. And others add to that that this verse indicates not only that he's merely human, but that he was sinful like every other person. Why do you call me good? There's no one good except God. But both of those explanations completely misread this text. Jesus neither denies his deity nor denies that he is good. His question to the young man, why do you call me good, is a challenge. It is a counter because underneath the young man's greeting and his question is an implied question that he didn't say out loud. Will you acknowledge that I have done enough to be worthy of eternal life? Will you affirm that I am good? But Jesus counters that question by challenging the man's motives and his assumptions. Jesus challenges him and says, why do you call me good? Do you know what you are saying when you call me good? No one is good but God. Do you understand what you are asking of me? Do you recognize who I am? See, the second of the man's problems was really the deeper, the more uh, critical issue. He'd approached Jesus as if Jesus was a teacher, uh, uh, someone with an opinion that he probably should consider. And he'd asked a question. He wanted to find out if he could add another name to this list of those who would assure him that he was righteous. And he would weigh this teacher's opinion. He would compare it to what he'd heard from others and see how it lined up, see if it confirmed what he wanted to hear. But Jesus never submitted to that line of questioning. And he forces the issue back on the young man. If you call me good, are you willing to treat what I say as the word of God? Because there's no one good except God. Do you understand who you're talking to? If you call me good, are you going to submit to my call? Are you going to come and follow me? Are you willing to take up the burden, not just of memorizing the commands and following them as best you can? Are you going to take up the burden, the yoke of following my commands? to take my teaching as your law? Are you willing to forsake that which you think is good in order to find that which is truly good? Will you follow me? That was the problem. And that was what Jesus was asking him. And that's what he's asking you. Do you understand that God's love for you is personal? It's not generic. He has a special love for you. He sees what you can't see. Do you understand that salvation, eternal life, entrance into the kingdom of God, that it's a gift, you can't earn it. You can't barter for it. You can't do enough good to be worthy of it. You can't talk your way into it. All you can do is humble yourself, admit your need and receive it. Do you realize today that what you're hungry for is what is truly good? God's what you've been looking for. The relationship with God is what you've been looking for. And it only comes through Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's God who's come to us, who showed us what God is like, who demonstrated what God is, who God is, and his love for us. He's the only one who's truly good. Are you still thinking that Jesus is someone whose opinion you ought to check out, someone you'd sort of consult with to see if you like what he has to say? Or have you come to the point of recognizing that he is the only one who knows what he's talking about? And that his word is absolute and supreme. It's not negotiable. Do you understand that you ignore him at your peril? Jesus says, will you surrender? Not, will you listen and decide if you like what I say or not? 
He never offers that option to anyone. Come, follow me is an invitation. It's also a command. The invitation to find what is truly good, the command, if you want to find me, this is the only way. You surrender and you follow.